Good morning, everybody, and welcome to such a, a good turnout today. We have with us today John Lonsdale uh, from Edgewood Gardens in Pennsylvania. Uh, however, John was born in Sheffield, England, uh, and, and earned degrees, uh, including a doctorate <coughs> in biochemistry and microbiology at the University in Newcastle upon time. He became a microbial biochemist and worked on antibiotics in the pharmaceutical industry for many years. Uh, John got involved with plants in a serious way when he moved to southeast England and got involved with alpine plants and became a member of the Alpine Guard Society and showed plants and pots at local and national shows, earning many awards for his uh, potted plants. John and his family moved to the United States in uh, 1995, and here he began developing a garden on uh, one and a half acres, which we'll be talking about today, in southeastern Pennsylvania in a town called Exton, uh, where he grows many ephemeral plants, little plants, bulbs, uh, shrubs, uh, including a large collection of daphnes too. He currently sows about 450 pots of plants each year. Uh, he's here today to tell us about the plants that he grows in Pennsylvania. Please welcome John Lonsdale. All righty, good morning everybody. Can you hear me okay? I have a cold, so my voice is deeper than it is normal, which is a good thing. Um, well, yeah, thanks Bobby for the introduction and, uh, and the invitation to come down and, and talk to the group. It's always a pleasure to come down here. So, I also dodged a snowstorm in Philadelphia, so that's, uh, that's always a bonus. Although it was the first snowstorm of the year, so it might have been nice to actually see some white flakes coming down. Um, I'm going to just stand over here, if that's okay, if I'm not blocking anybody's view. Um, Bobby said, I'm going to talk about the, some of the choice woodland plants that I grow in our garden in Exton, but before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about the garden before I get into the plants. Um, most of you probably know where Philadelphia is, I'm sure. Um, Exton is about 40 miles directly west of Philadelphia. Kind of, if you go on the old main line in Philadelphia, and get to the end and fall off, that's kind of where we are. <laughs> um, and we're about four, just over 400 miles northeast of Raleigh. So we're, we're solid zone 6B. So we get down to minus five Fahrenheit, probably two out of every five years. Um, we can, last two years ago, we were um, below freezing day and night for over 30 days in January and February. So it gets cold. Um, and a lot of that is without snow cover. So we can get 80 inches of snow, we can get an inch and a quarter of snow all winter. Um, so all the plants that I'm going to be talking about today are all hardy under these conditions. So I think they're going to be fine down here from a cold hardiness point. Some of them may struggle a little bit more with your summer heat and humidity, which is obviously worse than ours, so you may have to do a little bit of juggling. So uh, this is just a view up our driveway. We have a 400-foot driveway here, and then the garden opens up into a, a big diamond, and it's about 1.6 acres. Um, it's bisected by a long slope that's about 400 feet long and about 65 feet high, and a lot of the plants that I'm going to show you are actually growing on that slope. Some are up in the woods up here, um, and, and a few of them down here, but it's generally more sunny down at the bottom. Um, the we're on the north side of the Great Valley as you come out from Philly. So we get some shelter because we're just below the ridge. We get shelter from the northeast and the northwest. So we definitely have a kind of a microclimate where we're a little bit warmer than the surrounding area, which is great because I like to push the limits of some of the plants that I grow. It has a slight downside in that if we don't have much of a winter like we've had so far, then the really early stuff can come out early. And then if we get cold in January and February, then they can get nailed. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, the drainage in the garden is superb, and it falls away about 400 feet down here to the valley bottom. So we have no, no stagnant water whatsoever. And that's good, because virtually all of the plants that I'm going to talk about need perfect drainage. That's, that's the key to growing them. Um, pr probably the, the best advice I was ever given by somebody was, if you can grow the roots, the plants will take care of themselves. 
So don't worry about what's going on above ground, just make the roots happy and, and the plant will take care of itself. Actually the most important thing in this photograph, apart from the dog, is this gate. And you'll see why. <laughs> so when we, when we moved in in September um, 95, I think two days after we moved in we found there was no garden there, but there were 13 deer in the yard. And we were, we were in heaven. I mean, the, you know, the kids loved it, and we loved it, so we went out and we bought corn and we bought soul licks. <laughs> and uh, encouraged them in. It was great. And Because uh, only the queen in England is allowed to own deer, so we had, we had our own herd of deer. It was brilliant. But then I started planting some trilliums, and I guess in the spring they came up, and. I remember having a shave and looking out the bathroom window one morning and there was Bambi, yeah, with like a couple of trillion grand before and just hanging out of her mouth with the roots and the rhizomes and everything just waving in the breeze. So at that point we just, we put up this Benner's deer fence and that goes around the whole property and there's a gate and it works very well. And, uh, they don't like it but that's tough. <laughs> So before we come into the garden proper, I just want to talk about some of the, I do have some plants outside the deer fence. Um, and these are plants that I can honestly say the deer have never ever touched. Um, this is uh, one of the Chinese May apples, Ponophyllum pleanthum. Um, spread around a lot in a wetter area of the, the ditch by the side of the driveway. I think this, this has very unpalatable leaves. I think there are short hairs and there are spines on the leaves. They've never touched those. I wish they would eat all these dandelions, but they don't eat those either. Here we have, a, there's about 15 different species peonies all the way up and down the drive. Um, they don't touch those. And if you look at peonies as they're coming through, you'll see that the foliage has a lot of hairs on it. And I think it's the hairiness of the foliage that the deer really don't like. Um, so that, that's good. There's loads of hellebores hundreds of hellebores all the way up and down the drive. They don't touch those either, at least with me. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, four flowering colchicans. And they make a toxic compound which will kill the deer. So I would actually wish they would eat them. <laughs> but they don't. Um, this is one of the one of those peonies. This is Peonia Locus of which It's absolutely gorgeous. There's about eight of those down the drive. They're not all this color. Locus of is typically thought to be a yellow peony, that's what everybody wants. But in the wild, there are pink forms, there are yellow forms, and there are forms like this. So, if you do get a pink peony Mocus of Ichii, don't kill the guy that sold it to you, because it is the right species, it's just not the yellow one. So, moving up the driveway, um, this is the slope that I mentioned. It's got a lot of native trees on it, oaks, um, hickories, some dogwoods. I planted a lot of uh, native azaleas. This is a Japanese maple. Uh, there's tulip trees, American beeches. Most of them you can see I've limbed up because I want to maximize the use of the land underneath the trees. And there's the, the ubiquitous dog who's, who's everywhere. <laughs> I just wanted to show you this. This is up by the, the driveway and it's something that you don't see that often. There's woodland plants here, there's Virginia bluebells and epimediums and hellebores juxtaposed with cacti. And, I mean, the cacti are fine. The, the point I want to make is a lot of the woodland plants, in the wild, you'll find them tucked away in the dark, dry, shady corners because they can't compete with other plants in the woodland. If you can put them in an artificial situation in a garden, Bring them out into more sun, make sure they don't get too much competition, make sure they get plenty of moisture in the spring. You actually get bigger plants, better plants, and tons more flowers. So, yeah, Iris cristata that's away in the shady woods, you'll just get a few spindly growths and one or two of them will flower. You put it in the conditions like this, it'll make a tight map and you'll get hundreds of flowers. So don't be afraid, even with the hellebores, They'll take a lot of sun. Don't be afraid to pull plants out, and they'll thrive, and they'll give you far, far better flowering um, than if you took them away in too shady or too dry a place. Then this is just around the back of the house, just an example of the early spring. You can see it's a, it's a steep slope, but it's it's manageable. I, I'm 60 now, and it's still manageable. 
I'm not sure how long it'll be managed before, but um, there are some paths which snake around on the on the hillside. But you can see lots of epimediums with their new foliage, lots of erythroniums in here, spring beauty, phlox, hellebores, uh, lots of eranthus, uh, styrofoam, the, the yellow poppy. And there's thousands of trilliums in here which have, have yet to come up when I took this picture. So the whole whole slope, and, and sycamore as well, I'll show you the sycamore header folding in a minute. But the whole slope really starts to take life in late March. And the transition is incredible. Around the back of the house, um, I've built some raised beds down the driveway, around the turnaround, and some around the back of the house. I used to put humus in them because you you know you hear that humus is a good component for raised beds. But what humus does is over time in hot, wet climates, it'll rot, the bed will sink, and you lose the bed structure. And then what do you have to do? You either sulk and don't do anything, or you have to dig it all out and start again. So I actually went over for these beds. It's a mix of 50% concrete sand, which is a coarse sand, and 50% screen topsoil. And the screen topsoil has a little bit of its own humus in it, but that's it, 50-50 topsoil, concrete sand. That goes in those beds. The drainage is great. The clay component in the topsoil holds on to enough moisture, holds on to enough nutrients. And pretty much all the plants I'm going to talk about do really well in these beds. And it keeps it simple, and they keep the structure as long as you don't walk on them, and, and they last a long time. And I've also got three greenhouses that hold my Sickleman collection, the propagations that I do, um, obviously they're, they're extremely useful. I have some Sickleman that are not hardy with us that have to stay in there. And then all the, the little guys that I brought, um, they, some of those live in there and some of them live in cold frames. Alrighty, so yeah, it's a, we came over from the UK in 95, as Bobby said, and uh, I quickly realized that Pennsylvania is a deciduous forest. But, um, <laughs> I and mean, we didn't have a tree in our English garden. So um, our neighbor leaned over his, over, over his deck rail and shouted at me about a week after he got there, hey, John, what are you going to do about all the leaves? And yeah, I, didn't, I had no idea what he was talking about. So I largely ignored it um, because yeah, I, took, I cut this out of an English gardening magazine. And you can see it's, it's about a, a, a yard by a yard, a cubic yard of stuff. And it says economical, expandable, ex expandable compost bin holds a season's worth of leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't about to go down to Lowe's and make a fool of myself looking for one of these, especially when um, <laughs> we have a few leaves. They didn't all get there naturally. Um, what I decided to do, because there's so many treasures up on the hill, I blow all the leaves down with a backpack blower onto the driveway and around the back of the house. And the idea is to shred them, into bag them, and get them back up on the hill and, and use them as a mulch. And 20 years ago, that was great. Um, yeah, this was a while ago. This is my youngest daughter, and this was just a minor spring cleanup. This is the shredder that I use in the bags. And she was helping, but I, you get the impression already from the body language. <laughs> but, um, and the fact that the bike is there ready to make a quick getaway. <laughs> She is not going to be the future help of Edward Gardens while Dad's getting too old. Um, and it's hard work. It took us at that point, it took us three full days to get everything blown, shredded, bagged, and carry the bags back up. So. John, the remotes are radio controlled. You don't have to aim it anywhere. Just, just press the go. button. So you wonder why I'm putting a wedding picture from my middle daughter on the screen. Well, this is, this is Laura and this is her now husband Ryan, well, she, she didn't realize that while she was looking for the man of her dreams, I was also looking for the man of my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> it, took a, it took a while, I had to veto several of the prospective suitors, but um, eventually they got married and, and Ryan has been a, a tremendous help and to this day we... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's become a tradition. We've been doing it for about eight or nine years together now. And, um, we're finishing. We drink several, several pints of beer, and uh, it's great. He hates it, but he loves it. It's one of those things that he loves to hate it, but he wouldn't do. He wouldn't do without it. So that's. Uh, so I think we're we're set now. And also, I've decided because the leaf, the leaves that I blow down when they're shredded, I don't have enough to get back and cover the whole hillside. 
and I don't want bare areas that are going to erode and weak leads are going to germinate and stuff. I've been leaving more leads up on the top and just blowing them down. So it's a much shorter job. I think we got it done in a day this year. So it's kind of cool. Okay, so on to the plants. So being British, um, we don't like sweating and stuff in the summer. Um, and I very quickly found when we came here that sweating is something that can't be avoided. Three, three changes of t-shirt every time you mow the grass. So, well, I got rid of the grass. That's how I got rid of that. Um, so in the summer, I tend to disappear into the basement and repot my snowdrops and pot up my sickle and stuff. And I try and re-emerge at the end of September, just when the cyclamen are getting going. So the, I, what, what I've done is taken the gardening year from the end of September, basically right through to the end of the next summer, and that's the way I'm going to work it. Um, so these guys, will, just as we're cooling down at the end of September, these guys will start to jump into growth. This is a, the, a, probably a seven or eight year old tuber, single tuber. And you can actually identify some of the cyclamen species pretty closely just by looking at the tuber. Hydrofolium is one of the only ones that make roots all over the surface of the tuber. And you can see it's, it's just started to throw up a few um, flowers. And down here there's incipient flowers coming and also baby leaves. And if you look, these are little tiny babies from the previous year. Just kind of hanging on somehow. Um, so this is just part of the back of the, the hills um, with cyclamen hydrofolium on it in October, and there's literally tens of thousands of tubers, and it looks incredible. The flower color doesn't vary very much from a, a kind of a nice medium deep pink through to pure white, um, but the, the display is amazing. I planted about 400 tubers, tiny tubers, about 18 years ago, and there must be 20,000 plants out there now, and they make thousands and thousands of seedlings every year. There's not a lot of variation, I say, in the flowers. This is an oddball called Stargazer. It has a mutation that doesn't allow the flower to turn upside down like normal cyclamen. I don't like it. Some people like it. Some people um, definitely don't like it. But that's about the only change, the only variation you'll see in cyclamen heterophobium flowers. But in the last seven or eight years, there's been two real color breaks found in heterophobium, both of which are absolutely amazing. Um, this one was found by a friend in the Netherlands who's since passed away. Um, and it can be so, such a dark purple, it almost looks black. It's incredible. And that's pretty much stabilized now as a good strain. Um, so that is really exciting to have. This is my favorite. This is a true red cyclamen heterophone, found by the Cyclamen Society in an expedition to the island of Torfun. And you can start getting red seedlings out of some of those plants now as well. So they should start getting around, but they're absolutely amazing color breaks. But you don't grow them just for the flowers. The flowers are out for about six weeks. The foliage is out for about eight months. They make the foliage with me starting in early November, and it goes right through uh, into June. So there's a whole bunch of different foliage types. I just selected some of my favorites. I've been doing a lot of work with these arrow-shaped ones. This is one called fairy rings. This is a heterofolium subspecies crassifolium, which is a tetraploid. This is that light, um, Ashwood Lysander strain. This is one called Tarvan Graham. But I, I, I grow about three and a half thousand new seedlings every year. And out of those three and a half thousand, I probably keep back at least 50 because they're things that I'm not really, they're different or better or things I haven't seen before. It's, it's incredible. And just, this is all cyclamen heterofolium foliage on the hill at the back. And yeah, it's a ground cover, but it's not it's not an aggressive ground cover. You can see that Dutchman's breaches, the dicentra here, um, epimediums grow through it, they even seed through it, um, erythroniums, there's um, anemonella thyroidis coming through it. There's a dandelion even struggled to get through it. Um, so it's just an amazing ground cover. And, and it's true that as time goes by, some of it dies out and it moves somewhere else and then they'll come back again over time. But um, it, it's so nice to look out of the back of the house onto that slope all winter long and just see this mass of cyclamen hydrofolium leaves. Cyclamen confusum used to be a subspecies of cyclamen hydrofolium. 
it's a species in its own right now. Um, flowers are a little bit dumpier, but they're scented. Most Tenebolium's flowers are not scented. These have a strong scent. And you, you can almost feel that leaf. I've actually got some here, and you can feel the leaves here. This is tetrapoid, so it's really thick and rubbery. And uh, the leaves have these beautiful markings. And this flower is at the same time as Cyclamen heterobolium. Cyclamen silicium doesn't have exciting leaves. These are the leaves here. These are heterobolium leaves. Um, wouldn't grow for the leaves, but the flowers are scented of honey. And that flowers in the fall as well, flowers in late October, early November, and it will just gently seed around into a little colony of plants. This is the white form, the normal form is a, is a nice pink form. Uh, Cyclamen in, in Taminatum, like Silicium, is a Turkish species. Uh, it's tiny. You want to grow this either in a trough or in a raised bed close to the house. Um, these individual leaves are certainly no bigger than a quarter. So it's, and the whole thing is probably not more than about two inches tall. So if you just grow it where you see it, it doesn't look like it should be hardy, but it's completely bone hardy in the garden. Not so much a, a scent on that one, but in nice forms, they have nice pencil lines up and down the petals. And if it gets really cold, the petals can turn pink. Easy to grow, very easy to grow. So I talked about growing cyclamen from seed, and I just this is one, this is just a perfectly good example of why you should grow cyclamen from seed. There was a, a cyclamen rolfsianum with really dumpy flowers, a, a pretty ugly flower, and I collected seed from that and sowed it, and six years later, this was one of the seeds. <coughs> so you just never know what you're going to get, um, both in changes in flower structure and also changes, especially in leaf pattern. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about the seeds and how you propagate them from seed. So, um, seeds are ripe uh, end of June, July, and it doesn't matter which species you're working with, they're all ripe at the same time. Which is remarkable if you think that Cyclamen hedrifolium is pollinated in October and Cyclamen ripandum is pollinated in April and May. So hedrifolium takes, whatever, 10 months to ripen its seed. Ripandum can do the same job in two months, but they're all ripe at the same time. And what happens is, when the flower's pollinated, the flower falls off and the seed capsule coils down underneath the leaves. And it sits there all winter protected until it grows to about the size of a marble by the, by the middle of you know, early summer. At that point, it's really hard. If you squish it, it's like a glass marble. If you wait another few days, it'll go soft. It gets some gas in it. That's when the seeds are ready. And if you leave it at that point, it'll pop open. You'll see what's down here at the bottom. And the, the shiny stuff on the seeds is actually sugar. And the sugar is obviously an attraction to ants which will distribute the seed through the garden. So you have two choices, basically. You can take the seed away inside at that point, let it dry out, it becomes less sticky, you can clean it and you can sow it yourself, or you can just leave it and let the ants do the work. And you can see these are mature plants, and down here are a few seedlings. You see here? Wow. These are, they just make the single cotyledon the first year. Um, and I, I don't know how they hold on them because they're, they're just held on by the tiniest little string of a root. Um, but basically, in three years' time, they will be flowering sized plants. You can show the ants, just take them into cracks in rocks. Each one of those is an individual plant that's growing from a seed that an ant put in the rocks. Um, and you can already start to see the differences in the markings on the leaves. On the next slide, yeah, they dump them in amongst the rocks. These are more mature plants. And the next slide, they like to put them in amongst the roots of deciduous trees as well, which is great for the cyclamen as well, because the trees suck the moisture out of the ground, which is really what you want in summer, because cyclamen, they'll take a lot of water through the winter and the spring and the fall, but they want to be on the dry side and well-drained in summer. So base of trees is perfect. Um, so if you want to take the other root and sow them yourself, I uh, say so you just clean them. Um, I use this, this mix here, which is from Edenton, North Carolina. It's called Biocom PC5. And you can see, what do you think this is? Yeah. It's a peanut hole. So it's a mix of composted peanut holes and composted bark. And then I add about 40% perlite. And this is what I grow all my plants in and what I sow all my seeds on. 
So they all go into either two and a half inch or three and a half inch pots, filled to within about half an inch of the top with the mix that I showed you. Sow the seeds on the surface of the, of the, of the um, mix. Add about a half inch of gravel just to keep them, keep them clean, keep them in place. Water them, put them in the bottom of the greenhouse. I do all my sowing by the end of August. And then that allows the hydrated seed to get enough time and a warm temperature. And then as the temperatures start to fall, it needs about um, 60 days below um, about 50 Fahrenheit. And then at that point, the seeds will start to germinate. And they tend to germinate at the time the parent plant comes into growth. So you'll get break and comes up first, then heterofolium, etc. And purpurescence, which is the summer flowering cyclamen, doesn't germinate until the following summer. But this is what the seed pots will look like you know, a month or two after they after they germinated. You'll only get this one leaf the first year. Um, so you, and you don't get any information about leaf shape, but again you can see you can see the markings. And the next slide, I basically take them through to the next August like that, keep them growing as long as I can, then they get potted into individual two and a half inch pots. And then the next slide, by the time three years is up, most of them are, are flowering and are ready to go in the garden or, or be sold or given away or whatever. Um, Cyclamen Graecum and Cyclamen Rolsianum can take four or five years to get to flowering size. But it, it's easy, you, you just need a system. People say it's hard to grow Cyclamen from seed. It really isn't. It's, an, it's very, very, very easy. You just have to follow a certain set of rules. Potting them, repotting them if you, if you grow them in pots, or planting them into the garden if you want to do that. There are certain times of year that you want to do that. They're in the Primulaceae, and members of the Primula family, they make roots in the spring and in the fall. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's when you want to be transplanting your sycamore. You can put them in the garden in April and May, because even though the tops are tending to be going dormant, it's no harm done because they're still going to make some new roots so they can get established. Then when it gets hot, they've got active roots that can get some moisture in and they won't shrivel. If you do the same thing in the summer with these guys, you pull them out, the roots are dormant, you pop them up, it gets hot, the tubers will start to shrivel. And what would you do if the tubers shriveled? You'd water them. But the roots are dormant, they can't take any water up, so you rot the bulbs. So if you wait, next slide please. Wait until you can just start to see some growth. You see that this is a leaf coming here, and there's all this stuff is new growth. You, you'll start seeing that in August. And at that point, next slide please. If you look here, this is a, a different species, but you see these little white threads? These are new roots that are forming. So you know that they're making roots that can take up the moisture. It's still hot outside, but if you pop these up now, you can safely give them water because they can move the water through the plant it won't desiccate and it won't rot. So I do all of my work in August and September, um, unless I'm planting them planting in the garden in the spring. So moving away from cyclamen for a minute, it's still in the fall. Um, folks don't tend to think of many fall flowering crocuses, and they don't, certainly don't tend to think of fall flowering woodland crocuses, which is what both of these are. This, this is almost too, um, we're almost too warm. Crocus fanaticus. It's, it's an Albanian, Romanian plant. It likes it really cold. Thrives at 3,000 feet at State College in central Pennsylvania. Probably wouldn't do here. I don't know if anyone's tried it. Um, but Crocus nudiflorus is a Mediterranean plant. It's stoloniferous and it seeds around. And like a lot of Mediterranean plants that flower in the fall, they need to be pollinated in the fall. So they have a delightful scent. These are, have a beautiful honey. Um, so that'll run around and make some really nice patches and ever so easy to grow. Um, most, most Mediterranean bulbs, that, that the bulk of them flower in the spring, have representatives that flower in the fall, and snowdrops are no different. This is, and obviously Nancy at Montrose has a, an incredible display of snowdrops, and a Galanthus LYCI variety monostictus, which is what this is, this is one called Potter's Prelude. And I have this in flower, usually the week before Thanksgiving, every year. And then there's two really delicate species, Galanthus regini algae from Greece, and Galanthus peshmeni from Turkey. Uh, both flower again in, in October and November. 
and they make their leaves soon after they flower, so they're completely hardy through the winter and they, and they build up nice colonies with us. So I think they would do really well down here. This shows you some of those Galanthus bursanus that Tony, Tony auctioned. And you, know, you can see a lot of variation already in the different flower forms. I love these kind of seersucker puckered outers. And the scent is amazing. And, and to boot, it's really, really vigorous. It's, it's the plant that gives you everything. So it's, it's just a really cool, cool plant to have. And it does well in the garden as well. So I, I tended to grow most of them in pots because I've grown them from seed, but we're getting, it, getting them in the garden now and they do really well. Okay. So I took this picture yesterday. And I've got a bunch of clumps of this on our south facing slope. If we had a, a, a cooler January and February, I usually don't see this until the end of February. So the fact that it's out now, we've not been real hot, but we haven't been real cold. We haven't been below 18 degrees centigrade. So it's nice to see them, but I know what's coming. <laughs> so, and the bees have been out, the bees have been all over them. Um, it's cool. These are in the, in the ranunculus family, the buttercup family, the ranunculaceae. And a lot of the plants I'm going to talk about now it's interesting, a lot of the ranunculaceae are early flowering ephemeral plants. Um, but this, this is cool, it'll send out a bunch of ferny growth when the flowers are done. It'll hang around a couple of months and then it'll disappear. It's a Japanese plant, northern Japanese plant, and it's very, very hardy. Um, and when it's gone down, you can dig it up in spring and divide it when you can still find it, or you can wait until the fall and stab desperately into the area where you think it should be, <laughs> smash it into pieces. Don't worry, I've done this. And, uh, and then get, give up. So I would recommend if you're going to divide it, lift it in the spring and, uh, and do it. But it's, it's a beautiful thing. And there are orange flowered ones, there are white flowered ones. It's really neat. And this is Aranthus, just the, the common winter aconite, which is normally an acid yellow. Um, these are just three different forms. They all come true from seed, which is really neat. So you can build up individual colonies of these. It's interesting that the pale yellow ones always come up a couple of weeks before the other ones. I'm, I'm not sure why, wherever they are. Um, these are just starting to push through the ground at home now. But this is one of my favorites. This is another northern Japanese winter aconite, or Anthus pinatifida. And pure white flowers with kind of yellow and blue and purple sexy bits, and when they leaves get going, they're a glaucous blue, and they're very, very finely divided like hands with white lines down them. So it's a, just a superb, hardy plant, sets a lot of seed, and not hard to grow at all. It's just hard, harder to get hold of. This is amazing. Um, you find very, very occasionally mutants like this in some populations, of big populations of uh, around this high marlis, it's a mutant, and I, I guess a lot of the, the petals and some of the, um, the female parts have been turned into these uh, wiggly green and yellow bits. It does keep some stamens, so it will make pollen, so you can use it as a pollen pollen on other, um, other plants. I named it after my wife, not because she's a mutant or anything. But, um, <laughs> it's just so stunning. It's, it's, an, it's just an amazing plant. This is the cro <coughs> excuse me, the crocus that somebody was asking that I've got over here. This is Crocus heucalianus snow princess. In the wild it grows in high alpine pastures, so it's not a woodland plant, but it gets shade from the grass as the grass grows in the pastures. Our, we don't have grass, so the, the trees basically do the same thing, but it has these lovely white flowers with these purple markings on it. And that flowers early, um, and then it'll, it'll go down and it'll build up slowly into a small colony. And obviously every shade garden has, has hellebores, or if they don't, they, they should. This is just some that um, I've been collecting over the years, mainly from Dick and Judith at the Pine Knot and some seedlings that I raised from Germans. Or, and I wouldn't be without them. Interestingly, we, we cut our foliage off in October or early November because I need to blow the leaves down and the foliage gets in the way of the leaves. And at first I was a little bit worried about whether that might damage the plants, but it has no effect on them at all. So if you're a clean and tidy person, you can go ahead and tidy up your hellebores in the fall. But the ones outside the fence, we leave until 
January because it's more convenient. But, um, you have some beautiful stands in these. They, they, they're, they're just gorgeous plants. But yeah, the species I think are certainly have more of a charm. Um, this is Haliborus niger. This was, I took this picture yesterday as well. So you can see how far ahead the garden is. And I think this is a, a, was an all white niger that it's self sown. But I think one of the seed parents must have been one of the black thorn strains of Haliborus niger, which gives a pink flush to the back of the petals, which is really nice. But uh, these, these are starting to flower all over the garden now. And I'm sure they're in flower. They flower down here as well, they must be. And there's a whole bunch of species that, once you've lost the label, become <laughs> extremely difficult to identify. Um, so this is one of they, but a lot of the species have nice dark flowers, but they also have incredibly finely divided bracts, and then when the flowers are gone, the leaves are also very finely divided. Um, so all in all, plants like this are, are wonderful. It would be nice to have a lot more of these. Helleborus tibetanus was reintroduced from China probably 15 or 18 years ago. I think it had been in cultivation a long time ago. The best forms have pewter colored leaves when they come through with a purple flush and the flowers range from white through deep pink shot through with red lines. It's absolutely gorgeous. The first year they came back in, folks didn't realize that they're summer dormant and they grew them and they thought they died and they chucked them on the compost heap. But the good news is the next Spring, all their compost heaps <laughs> sprung into life with Helleborus tibetanus. So it goes dormant in the summer. So when it disappears, don't worry, it hasn't died. Um, and this is another of those species. I would grow this just for the foliage. This and Helleborus abrusicus is another one with this amazingly finely cut foliage. Um, Hepaticas, I grow a lot of Hepaticas. Hepatica nobilis likes it a little bit cooler than we are. Um, obviously there are, there are the two native species, uh, Americana and Acuto Oval, which are very nice. This is my all-time favorite, Hepatica. It grows on the Korean Peninsula. The flowers are either white or this baby pink. Comes into growth really early in the spring. The foliage is this browny, olive, and silver. And unlike the markings on all the other Hepaticas that I grow, it'll keep those markings right through until the leaves become deciduous in the fall. Um, and you can grow this from seed. It's, it's relatively easy to grow from seed. And then there's all that myriad of Japanese fancy Hepaticas, which I'm sure you've seen all the doubles and all the weird and wonderful stuff. My wife still doesn't know, and if Brian or Dick tells her, I'll kill him. Um, I spent several thousand dollars on some of these about seven years ago and planted them not realizing that they are magnets for botrytis. So I may as well just put the money in a shredder because about three months after I planted them, they, would, they just melted. So I would point you away from some of the Japanese cultivars, not just because they cost the earth, but because they're actually very difficult to grow, De certainly down here. If you live in Northern Europe, they're very easy. But this, this is just gorgeous. And it'll be flowering in about a month. These are natives of our common uh, mayapple, Chinese mayapples. And the foliage, I think you'll agree on, on this one, is absolutely incredible. Dysos medullabaya, and these are the flowers. This is that plant I showed you down the drive, when I said the deer don't eat. And it gets to about four feet tall, has these clusters of red flowers. The only downside is they stink, they're fly pollinated. So they have a horrible smell, but you have to get pretty close to be really grossed out, so it's not, it's not too bad. And they run around, this guy included, it'll make, um, make new plants from adventitious buds on the roots. So you, you know, if you want to, you can chop the roots up and you can make some baby plants. Uh, back to cyclamen, so heterophobium is really the, the queen of the fall cyclamen garden. Coom is her equivalent in the spring. Um, you're wondering what's going on here because this says Sycamore Coon. These are actually heterophonium flowers. So this picture was taken in September. But again, you see Coon's in full leaf. So even though it doesn't flower till spring, you've got the foliage in the garden for a full seven months. And then this has already made its flower buds, but it tucks them under the leaves and they don't come above ground until February 
or March, depending on the weather. Um, so if you have heterophyllium and coon in the garden, segregate them a little bit because the heterophyllium can seed around a little bit more aggressively. You're just going to have a fabulous ground cover with flowering in the fall and in the spring. And these are just four individual tubers. That's just one plant in each of those. And just to give you some examples of the different leaf types and leaf markings of sickle and coon. And the next slide shows the, the flower. It's a little bit more vibrant than the flower color in, in heterophyllium. Um, and they'll feed around. They move around more than heterophyllium does. They, they'll do a fabulous job in one corner one year. And then two years later they'll be gone, but they'll appear somewhere else, and then they'll come back. So I just tend to let them let them get on with it. And yeah, like heterophyllum, there are new flower types. Three, four years ago, this didn't exist until my Dutch friend um, bred it. It's called porcelain, and it's a white coon with these beautiful red lines shot through the flower. It's called Meaden's Crimson. It's a devil to catch the the colour, um, but. Especially when you put it in the sun, it's a vibrant magenta that just screams at you. It's an incredible plant. And they come through from seed. They have plain green leaves, which I, I actually think shows off the flower nicer than, nicer than a silver leaf. Um, but always keep your eye open for you know, different breaks in flowers and in leaves. Uh, spring snowdrops, I won't labor on these. These are actually the only four snowdrops that are any different to the 2,500 that are really out there. Um, but now they, I understand when people say that snowdrops are, you know, what's the difference? And there's a ton that look just the same as any other one. But there are genuinely some really cool ones that are easily distinguishable. There's a lot of yellows that people want. These are virescents with green outers. Um, diggery is very popular with this kind of puffed out seersucker broad petals. And this pagoda type has become very popular as well. So. I think as long as you pick judiciously, and some of these are not that expensive anymore, <coughs> pick carefully, you don't have to spend a ton of money and you can get a nice collection of truly distinct crocus, uh, snowdrops. Erythroniums, I have a lot of erythroniums in the garden. Uh, there's really, they fall into two groups. There's the group you can't grow and there's the group you can grow. <laughs> and the group that you can't, I, I can't grow, you really, really can't grow. So, um, it's mainly the Pacific Northwest. There's about 18 species out there. <coughs> Probably half of them are really high altitude. Montanum, Grandiflorum, um, Pusateri, Purpurescens. Forget the names because you, never, you don't want them. Um, but they're high altitude. They need cool summers. They just they hate it here. But there's a whole bunch from the West that we can grow that um, they live at lower altitudes. This is one of them. This, um, Erythrium hendersonii here, grows in Northern California, Southern Oregon, grows really easily, sets a lot of seed. Um, this guy grows in the uh, Russian Caucasus, and it's one of the first plants in flower in the garden every year. Pure white flowers and these magnificently marked leaves. This is Erythrium caucasicum, Japanese species, Duponicum, um, big flowers and has these beautiful blackberry markings that vary tremendously in the, in the throat of the flower and they're easy to grow. Now this guy here, um, I found it down in Louisiana, it grows up into Alabama as well. Wasn't sure it would be hardy, but we smelt the colony a hundred yards before we could even see it. Mm. It's this amazing honey scent. Um, and even better, the, the flowers See these guys reflex? These guys tend not to. They open starry, and some of them are probably four inches across, and they follow the sun, and they smell of honey. So what's not to like? So this is a, a really cool native erythronium. Um, and the next slide actually shows my favorite native. And these grow around here. Um, you know, looking on the right, you would think it was erythronium americanum that makes, you know, makes millions of leaves and hardly ever flowers. This is Erythronium umbilicatum. And once bulbs get to flower in size, they stay flower in size and they, and they flower every year. So I've got rivers of these cascading down the hillside. They get longer every year as the seed comes down. And this is just a bunch of seedlings that aren't quite mature yet. So this is, this is definitely my favorite 
brown colour um, erythronium from these parts. And it's easy to grow, easy to grow from seed. The downside with erythroniums is they will take anything from five to seven years to flower from seed. So you have to be a little bit patient, like trilliums. Uh, I have a ton of Corydalis. I love Corydalis solida and some of the different species. Um, there's probably tens of thousands of those in the garden now because they've seeded around. Probably back 10, 15 years ago when these really fiery red ones came out, you would pay $100 for a bulb. And, you know, 15, 60 for some of these more unusual ones. Now the prices have become a lot more reasonable, maybe $10. What I would advise you to do if you like these is go out and buy six or eight that are all different, spend 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars, plant them close together, and in about three or four years, you'll have all the other ones anyway. <laughs> you won't have names with them, but they're gonna look just like all those expensive ones. And they, they seed around like crazy, the same thing, they're ephemeral, they're up in March, they set seed, end of April, they're gone. And you don't know where they are. Um, but, but they are wonderful. This is a, a different species, this is from Siberia, and it, it needs a cold summer, and obviously we don't have cold summers. If you give it too much moisture and too much warmth, it'll rot. So I push that back in the woods, plant it somewhere at the base of a tree where it's shaded and dry. That helps to stop it rotting, and I've managed to keep these alive for a few years now. But uh, they're, they're so easy to grow from seed, I just, just let them go. It's a little bulb that grows about three inches deep, and the bulb will make offsets as well. The last couple of spring cyclamen, um, this is cyclamen rhodium, related to cyclamen ripandum. Um, they grow in the Greek islands uh, and in France. They have very thin leaves and they flower late. So the sun's up high, the sun's stronger, they have thin leaves. So they need, they need a lot more shade, otherwise the leaves will collapse. But they have the most amazing scent. So, well worth growing. When you go to the tuber, it's tiny, about the size of a pea maybe, a little bit bigger. They're a tiny bit less hardy with us, so I plant them about eight inches deep. All the other cyclamen I plant no more than half an inch deep. These guys want to go deeper. So let, let them go dormant, and then you can plant them and forget about them. Down here, where it's not so cold, you can probably plant them maybe three inches deep, and they'll, and they'll be fine. But uh, the scent is amazing. And this is the last of the spring ones. Uh, this is Turkish, Cyclamen Pseudo-Americum. These vivid magenta flowers. These are its leaves here. These are the Repolium and Plum leaves. Um, has an incredible, intense, spicy smell. Um, so again, yeah, well worth growing. In, in, in the right conditions, it's, it's a long-lived plant. Uh, obviously, these are blood root. Um, I just put this in to illustrate a disease that about, I don't know, 10 years ago, I, I christened blood root complacency. Because I started to find that, you know, you get something like this, a red plant, it's beautiful, and you want a bigger and bigger and a bigger clump, so you don't fiddle with it, you just watch it grow, and then you go out the next spring, and there's nothing there. And same, I find the same thing happening in a lot of places in my garden. I've got a friend not far away, he had a two-acre hillside that was covered in blood root, just regular blood root. Within a two year time frame, they die out completely. Mm. They get a bacterial rot that just spreads out to the ends of the tips, and there's really nothing you can do to get them back. So, yeah, it's easy to be complacent, but what I do now is whenever I've got a blood root I want to keep, I go out, it's in full flower, I pull a piece off, move it somewhere else, pull a piece off, move it somewhere else. And if you do that, you're not gonna end up losing a whole red plant. I don't know, do you see that down here? Is that? Mm. Yeah? Well, you're just not a very good grower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something a little bit out of the ordinary. You wouldn't believe it, this is a spring beauty. Um, where he found it in the uh, corner of northeastern, southeastern Pennsylvania, northeastern Maryland. And it truly is a yellow spring beauty. Uh, and it looks a bit more orange because it has these red lines through the petals. It comes from, from seed and it's seed, seeded all over our garden and it hybridizes with some of the pink ones as well. And you get such an amazing mix. So I'm, I'm going to start making this available in the next couple of years as well. But they don't 
all have to be exotic plants. This is one of my favorites, Uvularia grandiflora. Every, everybody grows it. The common form is a, is a nice, good yellow. But this is a lovely, pale, straw yellow. So just keep your eyes open. And, and there are really dark, golden yellow forms as well. Um, there's lots of variation out there. You just have to be observant. And Phloxstolonifera, I mean, it's a real common plant. If you've got an acid garden, this was started from a two and a half inch pot. And you know, it's probably two yards across now in about four years. Um, and there's a white one up here. So just try and match the plants to the conditions where you can. I could do a whole presentation on epimediums, obviously beautiful flowers. This is my favorite, Epimedium lysishenii. The new foliage is a beautiful salmon tangerine, and then it transitions through this, I don't know, lemony color, to a lime green, and then a couple of months down the road, it's, uh, it's its regular summer color and, and, and yellow flowers. But the, the winter foliage on some of these epimediums is just, it's just amazing. And it's growing in amongst all that flocks and different epimediums. Most peonies, like full sun, peony of the Martin variety, will not eye has these gorgeous white globes and this kind of chocolate brown new foliage. Want some shade, um, comes true from seed. Iris again, people tend to think of them as being sun loving plants. Um, there's one or two that like it in the woods. I'd like to say these flowers were five or six inches across, they're unfortunately about an inch and a half across. But you can get a hundred of them on a plant maybe a foot and a half across, and they're on really delicate, wiry stems that dance in the breeze. Um, so just keep an eye open for iris chrysalopes, and there are some forms of it as well. And ever so easy to grow, it'll set seed, or you can just divide it. The peony you want to grow from seed, and it'll take about five years to get to flowering size. Um, Aroids are very much in vogue, and this is everybody's favorite, Aricema, Aricema sicokianum. You can see it, <coughs> excuse me, see it flowers early, um, has this beautiful white spadix and then the, the chocolate brown and green spade. It's an infuriating plant because it will not make offsets. So you're basically stuck with what you've got and the only option is to grow it from seed. So you need to wait um, until you get some female plants and then you can get the seed off those. And it'll take another three or four years then to grow them on from seed. You hope your parent plants don't die in the meantime. They're, they're not long-lived. They'll, they'll live maybe three to six years, and then they tend to fade away. Um, but they are gorgeous. Next slide, please. And this is a cool plant. This is an aroid that uh, grows on the island of Crete, Dracunculus vulgaris. It's called the dead horse arum. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It stinks of a dead horse. Um, and you can see the flies gathering from the, the feast. I don't work one day, the first year this was going to bloom, and my wife called me. And she said, there's a buzzard flying up and down the driveway. <laughs> and then she, I said, oh really, go and have another drink. And uh, then she called me back and she said, it's getting demented. It was getting more and more and more frustrated. And she said, she was watching it, and she said, finally, it dove into the plants. It had worked out where the non-dead horse was, and it just trashed it. It just it got so pissed, it just pulled it to pieces. <laughs> and then it kind of scratched its back legs and it tore off. And sure enough, I got home and then it was completely trashed. So I think that buzzard got, got somewhere else because it's flowered every year since, and uh, it's not been damaged, but I would love to have seen it, seen it do that. But the agitated buzzard story. Um, and actually, you could, uh, useful as well if you don't like your neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> if you just plant that, just, just respect, respectfully a few yards upwind of their bedroom window that they open at night. They'll be your friends forever. Um, trilliums. So, Eleanor thinks I came to the United States to, um, for a job. I actually came to the United States so I could grow trilliums in my garden. But, so that's another thing that she doesn't know. Yeah, um, especially these guys, these deep south um, sessile species. The next, if you could click it a couple of times, please. And the woody eye, relictum, and decipiens. They're basically the same top end. They just have longer or shorter stalks. At, at a molecular level, they're extremely difficult to tell apart. So it's kind of interesting how these are going to 
turn out, but they, they are just the most amazing plants. They come up in the garden with us late March generally. This is just an underwood here. I mean, how could you not go nuts over that? <laughs> just incredible. And then Trillium decumbens grows in Alabama, central Alabama, through into northern Georgia. And I've been in ravines where there's millions, literally millions of these little candles just all the way up the valley. It just looks incredible. I was in there one, one year with a friend, and this massive lightning storm came through. With all the lightning strikes, all the silver, silver leaf just lit up. It, it, it was incredible. And then I got the Jeep bogged down in the field, and, uh, and we were stuck there for the night. But it was still, it was still quite an experience. And Trillium cuneatum generally gets a bad press because it's a, yeah, it's common and it's, it's not that distinguished, but these are all forms of Trillium cuneatum. And here you get beautiful yellow flowers, silver leaves, partial silver leaves, silver with yellow. This is a high altitude form, but I think it makes this anthocyanin pigment because the light is so strong up there. And these also have acid yellow flowers, so that's quite an amazing find. And then you go into the, the pedicillates, where the flower is a little bit more showy, and it's up on a stalk. This Pusillum arabanicum calls home an Alabama swamp, which is a long way away from our dry Pennsylvania hillside. But it seeds around like crazy and, and builds up um, vegetatively as well. And that's one of the first, first uh, trillings to flower in the garden. So you don't always have to match the natural habitat to be successful with a plant. Next. Obviously the, the legendary Grandiflorum roseum, which is at its best on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then the next one, uh, beautiful, <coughs> fragrant, true and fle flexipes. This is the true flexipes from Alabama that has the white, uh, white ovary. So these are big, imposing plants. The leaves can be easily 15 inches across. Trillium vasei, sweet beth, is the last one to flower in the garden. That's not in flower until May. And it flowers underneath the leaves a little bit, which is not ideal. Those flowers can be as big as my hand, and they do smell sweet. But that grows high up on the Blue Ridge, and it needs moist coves to be happy. The, the adult plants will grow. It will not regenerate from seed in our garden because we're too hot. And then sulcatum is really easy to grow, depending on which taxonomist you talk to. These may or may not be sulcatum. This is the type. But you get these amazing... Um, Picatees and a, a myriad of different flower forms which are really exciting. Um, and these are seeding around all over the garden. Yeah, you, you don't really notice them for a while, it takes three or four years to notice them, and then uh, certainly once they start flowering, it's, it's incredible. Propagation the, the, uh, the sickleman had that sugar on them. These guys have a fatty eliosome on the seed, and that's attractive to wasps and probably ants as well. The wasps will actually cut into the seed capsules and take the seeds away. So you can get them distributed naturally. You can also collect them and sow them and go on holiday for seven years and come back. <laughs> and hopefully there'll be a few flowers. You can divide clumps if they are, um, if, if they'll let you, if they get big enough. This is truly niv -ailey. Or you, could, you can also do an ambulin on them. You can chop their heads off. Um, in, in this case, I, think it, I guess it was this end, Chop the head off that has the roots and the new growing point, plant it. That'll grow and flower next year. Then the back rise, I'm just planted, and these um, root scars will actually generate new growths which will act like seedlings. And in a few years, you can break them off and they'll go on to flower. Um, so there's lots of easy but relatively slow ways to propagate trilliums. Um, four orchids in the garden wouldn't be without orchids. This is Calanthe discolor. I know Tony offers a ton of Calanthus, which you do well outside with generally here. This is the only species that I can get to survive in Pennsylvania. Uh, it has these beautiful pleated leaves that come after the flowers. It's just gentle shade at the back of the, uh, back of the house. And then the next three, um, Cypripedium parviflorum, variety pubescens. These are obviously all native East Coast um, Cypripediums grow incredibly well. I've tried most all of the Chinese cypripediums. They hate the heat and the humidity in summer. So I've given up on pretty much all of those. Frankly, these are so beautiful, I don't think you need much more. And, and, and the Midwest and the Californian cypripediums 
unless you have an air conditioned greenhouse, I, you, you're not going to grow those either. So look out for these. This one is the large flower, the yellow lady slipper. The next one, the small flower, um, tends to have darker sepals, smaller pouches. It's beautiful. But the last one is, is my holy grail. That's Cypripedium kentuckiens. Um, we, we have over 200 flowers in the third week of May every year. And they build up, they are so easy to grow. They grow themselves. Um, and to propagate any of these, you can see that the shoots just go down into the dirt. But, but most of the roots go out sideways. They don't go deep down. So you don't dig them out per se. I get a garden floor, I slide it in underneath and just wobble it up and down a couple of times and lift it up and they pop out. And you, you can see natural division points, you can break them apart. Uh, some I keep on one side and some I'll give them away, the rest I just replant. And you can go from a replanted one or two nose plant to a 12 flowering nose plant in, in four years. And at that point they kind of settle down, so then I lift them again, divide them and, and keep on going. But it is just so trouble free, and you can grow them in a lot of sun, um, they don't want a lot of shade. It's just, it's an amazing plant. This is just weird. I, when I first found this in the woods, I thought, oh, I didn't think I was in North America. You just don't expect to find something like this. Um, but it's really cool. Um, it comes up late, so it's easy to damage it while you're hoofing around in June, waiting for it to come up. But absolutely beautiful. And it will gently seed around, or you can lift it and divide it. Um, another Western North Carolina native, Galax. They fill her or Ursia lot or whatever it's called now. A lot of them don't flower very well. They have these lettuce green, beautiful leaves, kind of like a short tip. This form flowers like crazy every year. But if you go to the next slide, this is its winter color. So this is what it looks like now. So it's genuinely a, a four season plant. One more Arasema. Um, doesn't come through the ground usually until July, so this is a, a perfect example of something that you're going to boss, and, and I've done that. It'll make big tubers, but it, the flowers are really nothing to, to shout home about, but the foliage, it can be even thinner than this, and they have really long drip tips, it, make, it just makes a beautiful um, effect. This is the last cyclamen. This flowers in July and August. It has purple flowers, it has an amazing scent. Um, it wants to be deeper in the, in the woods, it wants more shade, it wants a little bit more constant moisture. But it's, a, it's an amazing plant. I mean, the flowers are good enough. Next slide, like all the cyclamen, you just select some of the fabulous silver leaf forms. That takes longer to flower from seed. It makes ridiculously tiny tubers, and it probably takes at least four years to flower from seed, but it's well worth the wait. I have a colony of them up on the hill, and you can smell them on a, on a still summer's day. You can smell them from the driveway. It's just a really sweet smell. Now, just to finish up, you wonder why I'm showing a, a bog garden juxtaposed to a zeric bed, and this is a woodland talk. Well, there are some woodlanders that I have been so frustrated. I've not, I've desperately wanted to grow, but I just don't have any habitat in the woods. We're too dry. Um, so I thought, I built a bog garden, two bog gardens, and there's orchids in there, there's pitcher plants, there's all the usual suspects. But a bog garden works because you get, it's constantly moist and you get constant evaporation, and the constant evaporation keeps it cool. This is a, a European marsh orchid, which I couldn't grow to save my life in the garden. They're thriving in the bog. A lot of um, Asian Heloniopsis, um, there's some beautiful plants. I could not grow them in the garden. They just love it in the bog. Uh, and also, um, Polonius bolata, uh, the native swamp pink, does really well in the bogs as well. Some snowdrops. These are from high mountains in the Republic of Georgia. They never get very dry. They never get very warm. This is the end of the bog, right up against the magnolia. It's the high end. It's never too wet but it's never completely dry. And this is Gilanthus pandutinii and Crocnoei. They are thriving in there. And also, there's uh, Crocus peristericus, which grows in running water on the top of these really high green mountains. Mm. 
totally ungrowable. I got some in here and that they will probably flower this year. So don't be afraid to experiment. There's a, a ton of different ways that you can persuade plants to grow. This is one of Tony's introductions. I've seen the trifold blackjack. Couldn't grow it anywhere in the garden. I eventually tried sitting the pot in a saucer of water. That kept it going, but it, it's a, a pain to do it. So I stuck it in the bog, and it's gone nuts. It now flowers every year, makes stow ones, gets to be about two feet tall, um, and it's this incredible jet, oily jet white. Um, and Starburst, the other trifilum, grows, grows next to it. Okay, so with all these, all these tubers and corms and stuff that all the animals want to eat, we have, uh, we have our own Homeland Security Patrol. He <laughs> comes out of the tree occasionally for a treat. Um, on the next slide, we have our own foxes up at the top of the house. Oh, yeah. So w without the deer fence and without the animals, um, there would be no garden. So it's, uh, it's definitely important to have some sort of natural um, defense. And the last slide, my website has about 15,000 pictures of plants, which uh, you're welcome to go browse. Uh, if you have any questions, you can call me, you can email me. And Pine Knot, we have the first Pine Knot um, Hellebore open days coming up. What are the dates? There's the last, the last weekend of February and the second last weekend of February, the first two of March. I'll be at the first two, the last two weekends of February. So please come along to those. There will be a lot of these plants available. And all of Dick and Brian's wonderful health was as well. Thank you. question for everyone over here. Uh, how deep should we plant the sycamore head of folium? And I plant them about an inch deep, but what, you're, right, you're absolutely right, what does happen is, as the tuber grows, it will push itself up. I don't push them back. Uh, I just leave them be. And sometimes they'll get to a size and they'll rot. Um, and it's interesting, on a slope, I have a whole bunch on a slope like that, and we had really, really heavy rain, and it eroded some of the soil away. <laughs> And it looked like a whole bunch of flying saucers had crashed into them. So, so in that case, I did get some dirt and just cover them up a little bit. Um, but no, I, I typically just let them get on with it. Are your plants ready to go in the garden now? Uh, I wouldn't plant mine in my garden yet because the, the garden's still going to freeze hard. As soon as you know that the garden's not going to freeze hard, you can plant them out. Oh, so now keep them, what, in a garage, keep them cool and not cold? If, if, I mean, if you think your garden's not going to freeze, plant them out, or not freeze hard. Um, otherwise, just keep them somewhere cool and keep them watered. And don't let them freeze in the pots, because plants in pots are a lot more vulnerable than plants in the ground. Hmm. Sure. Two more questions. What's the question, John? I got seed now. And this, she got just got some seed. Okay. And should she sow it now or? And the answer is or. Um, <laughs> if I get seed after the end of August, 
I just keep it somewhere dry, you know, don't put it in the fridge, just somewhere dry and dark in the basement or something, and I wait until August of the following year, and then I sow it, and then it's on its natural cycle, so you can give it, you know, a couple of months, hydrated, warm, 60 days, below 15 degrees, and then it'll germinate. Whereas if you, you know, you could mess around with it now, and you could get it to germinate, but then it will be germinating just as we run into summer. And then it'll go dormant and you're going to get really tiny tubers and so just wait. Okay, one more question. Yeah. So how did you get the bog garden established? And how did you bog garden? How did I? Get the bog garden. Like how did you establish the bog garden? Oh the bog. Um, so there was another half of that Zarek bed was there, so there was a ton of sand. So a friend and I dug out the sand and made berms around the bottom edge um, of the Zarek bed. Um, I got a beautiful pool liner. It's about 30 feet long and about 15 feet wide. Put the liner in, um, built up some more sand, put some rocks on the top, and then filled it with a mix of 50% silica sand, 50% peat moss, and, and soaked it and let it sit for a week and then started planting it up. And I've only ever had to put water in from a hose pipe once. So it's, it, typically it, it manages just with the rainfall. It, it's an awesome little toy to have. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Um, I think you'll be here a little bit longer if people sure. want to buy yeah. plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope many of you will, all the chapter members will return their name tags to Bob Wilder. <laughs> And join us on February 8th for Will Hembry, who currently works at Longwood NC State Master's Graduate. He's going to talk about botanizing the Appalachian Trails. That's going to be a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, John.